Kaspersky, this story and more on this week's episode of ThreatWire. ASUS has released a series of patches for their routers over the past week. One of the CVEs, CVE 2024-3080, was given a CVSS score of 9.8. It allowed for authentication bypass for remote attackers. An additional CVE was also patched, CVE 2024-3079, which took advantage of a buffer overflow exploit to gain admin privileges. Census, a threat intelligence platform, published a short post estimating that over 157,000 routers currently online are susceptible to these attacks. Right now, the story is not well fleshed out in its publications. No proof of concepts for the CVEs have been published, nor any formal write-ups. We just have a vague publishing of the CVEs. ASUS has published these patches as mentioned earlier and encourages using different passwords for your wireless passwords and your router administration pages. I'm bringing you a cryptocurrency story, but not in the way that you think. We're talking about a bug bounty program. This past week, the Kraken Exchange came out and publicly stated that it was being extorted by a security researcher group that took over $3 million. Security researchers found a way to print money by taking advantage of a UX bug that allowed for trading of credited currency before actually having the trade completed and cleared by the blockchain and markets. When receiving word of this vulnerability, the Kraken team quickly responded and had a fix within two hours and completely resolved within a few. While the technical resolution was quick, the point of resolving and returning the funds was a different story. On June 19th, Kraken's chief security officer went online to publicize that Kraken was being extorted by the hackers because they didn't want to immediately return the funds, as well as acted in bad faith by taking too much money from the exchange and demanding certain business meetings from the Kraken team. The CSO said they were treating this as a criminal matter and that they are beginning the process of working with authorities. Within a few hours, Serti K released a statement on their Twitter explaining that their team was responsible for the findings and that the Kraken team was acting in bad faith. Specifically, the Kraken team was asking for a mismatched amount of cryptocurrency in an unreasonable time frame without proper details for returning the funds. The Serti K team explains their actions. Millions of dollars can be deposited into any Kraken account. A huge amount of fabricated crypto worth more than over $1 million USD can be withdrawn from the account and converted into valid cryptos. Worse yet, no alerts were triggered during the multi-day testing period. Kraken only responded and locked the test accounts days after we officially reported the incident. The team at Serti K didn't have permissions to do this huge long-term test. And this feels aligned with what some would expect when participating in a bug bounty program. They weren't commissioned to do this research. It was up to the researcher to decide how to execute it. This has fully turned into a public he said, she said spat. However, public consensus appeared to be on the side of Kraken's team. The funds were eventually returned soon after, but still feels a bit messy for a bug bounty program. I think companies are starting to lose the plot point of bug bounty programs. A researcher, hacker, or enthusiast submitting a bug through a program is doing that of their own volition. While choosing to not disclose a discovered bug isn't necessarily illegal, using it for bad actions is. Having a kind and hospitable bug bounty program is important to make sure hackers want to work with you, not against you. If someone wanted into your account, they could. New research was published by the Kaspersky team on June 18th stating that six out of 10 passwords could be cracked in less than an hour. The results were unnerving. A staggering 45% of the 193 million real world passwords we analyzed, that is 87 million passwords, could be cracked by the smart algorithm in less than a minute, 59% within an hour, 67% within a month, and a mere 23% of passwords could be considered truly strong, needing more than a year to crack. The team sourced their database of 193 million passwords via the dark web to make sure that the passwords were truly representative of the modern password ecosystem. They have and use this list of passwords as a way to ensure users of their password manager product are not compromised. In their password cracking exploration, the team used brute force and smart guessing algorithms trained on various password datasets. 
They also explain the cost of cracking the passwords. Given the current power of GPUs, hackers can rent high-end GPUs for less than an hour and crack multiple eight-character passwords for just a few dollars. Now more than ever, password leaks are becoming a more frequent issue. Not to talk about something I said I wouldn't talk about again, but I finally got an email from Ticketmaster saying I was affected by their leak. Finally. The team at Kaspersky finished off the article with their recommendations for keeping accounts safe, which include using strong passwords without meaningful words or phrases, don't reuse passwords, and don't save passwords in browsers as well as other things. I've linked the blog post below if you're interested in seeing the write-up or if you're interested in stepping up your password security. Kaspersky Labs is a Russian-based antivirus provider and cybersecurity tooling company that was founded around 30 years ago. Since then, it's been a leader in cybersecurity research and malware prevention. It started selling in the US sometime between 2005 and 2010, and this week is being forced to stop. On June 20th, the US Department of Commerce released a final decision about the company's ability to sell to US-based entities, moving to ban the selling, reselling, integrating, and licensing of any Kaspersky-related cybersecurity products. The final decision came down to making an assessment of the company's risk of being controlled by and under the jurisdiction of a foreign adversary country, in this case Russia. In addition, given its inclusion in major U.S. infrastructure, the final ruling calls for the concern of espionage, data theft, and system malfunction, along with the posed risks. At the outset, it is worth noting that regardless of whether Kaspersky's products contribute to greater cybersecurity for its customers, this does not necessarily, in the aggregate, increase national security. The risks to U.S. national security addressed in this final determination stem not from whether Kaspersky's products are effective at identifying viruses and other malware, but whether they can be used strategically to cause harm to the United States. The ban goes into effect September 29th, 2024. As soon as July 20th, 2024, Kaspersky is no longer allowed to enter any new business agreements with U.S. persons regarding their antivirus products or services. But while Kaspersky is not allowed to provide antivirus products and services, there are specific exemptions for their consulting, training, and advisory services. These are to still be allowed. The Kaspersky team publicly released a statement highlighting their commitment to transparency and independence of government pressures. Despite proposing a system in which the security of Kaspersky products could have been independently verified by a trusted third party, Kaspersky believes that the Department of Commerce made its decision based on the present geopolitical climate and theoretical concerns rather than on a comprehensive evaluation of the integrity of Kaspersky's products and services. Kaspersky does not engage in activities which threaten U.S. national security and, in fact, has made significant contributions with its reporting and protection from a variety of threat actors that targeted U.S. interests and allies. The company intends to pursue all legally available options to preserve its current operations and relationships. Immediately after banning the products, the U.S. Treasury announced sanctions on 12 leaders of Kaspersky Labs. The U.S. government's lack of trust of Kaspersky products is not new. In 2017, the president at the time banned the use of Kaspersky products and services in federal agencies as a part of the National Defense Authorization Act. More and more, we are seeing public and highly publicized moves regarding the lack of trust of software based out of countries that are considered foreign adversaries to the U.S. While the Kaspersky story may not be a popular public story, the same logic and concerns can be applied to the highly public story of the banning of TikTok in the US. Did I cover a story about research from the Kaspersky labs and then about the banning of their software back to back on purpose? Yes. The research the team did with password cracking is very interesting, but at the same time, the story of the banning of the software is important to highlight. I'm curious to hear, What's your thoughts on this situation? Do you think that this is a reasonable concern or do you think that this is going a bit too far? Thank you so much for watching ThreatWire for the week of June 24th, 2024. If you wanna support this ad-free show, please head over to patreon.com slash ThreatWire. I know I've asked this in the past, but I would love to know what you would love to see happen with the Patreon. Please, please, please let me know in the comments below. If you wanna find me online, I'm at Ending with Ally everywhere, including Minecraft. Good luck, have fun, and don't get caught.